fun. My name is Mark Hahn, and I am a member of the advisory board uh, of the TomTom Tom Foundation. Uh, and I am also the owner of Harvest Moon Catering here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, on behalf of the board and our team, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, today's event is part of a seven week virtual event series called the Cities Rising Summit. Cities Rising will explore critical issues surfaced by the COVID-19 pandemic and movement for racial justice, especially as they relate to small and mid-sized cities across America. All Cities Rising events will be available on a pay what you can scale. Thanks to the support of our sponsors and community members like you, if today's program resonates with you, which I hope it does, uh, as it does with me, please consider becoming a contributing member to the foundation. You can do so on our website, tomtomfoundation.org backslash give. The Cities Rising Summit will run until October 30th, and we encourage you to get as involved as possible over the course of the coming weeks. All talks throughout Cities Rising will be recorded so if you enjoy today's session, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with colleagues and friends. Please note that the chat function in the bottom right corner of your screen, you can use that to connect with other participants on the call today. Also, please note the Q&A function. You can use that to ask questions of our speakers. Our moderator will have his eyes on that channel and we'll include all your questions into how they steer today's conversation. All right, well, the title of today's talk is Hospitality on Main Street, how food could be the key to a better way of doing business and features celebrity chef and Oakland-based entrepreneur, Tanya Holland, in conversation with Charlottesville's own Antoine Brinson. This event is part of a week of thematic programs around small business and entrepreneurship and is brought to you by the Office of Equity and Inclusion for Albemarle County, Virginia, who we thank for their incredible support today. With that, I am pleased to introduce you to our moderator for today, Chief Executive Officer of Culinary Concepts, Antoine Brinson. Antoine, all you. Hey, good morning, uh, Mark. Thank you so much, man. I uh, appreciate the intro. Um, super, super excited about today's uh, today's topic and uh, the conversation. Um, for those of you that don't know Tanya, she is a, a titan in the industry. Um, she has everything everything from her her restaurant to her book um, to you know TV shows, all the way to you know what's is most important her community impact. Um, what she's been able to do over the span of her career in uh, the different different facets is absolutely amazing. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, to be on this call with her today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tanya to the call. Hi there. Good hey morning. girl, how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> you, you guys forgot to say and UVA alum. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna bring that up. I was gonna ask you what your connection to uh, for Charlottesville was. <laughs> right, graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences in 1987. That's that's awesome. That's that's so awesome. Your your resume um, is is super impressive and inspiring. I think that you know uh, more people out there should definitely do their homework and, and check out the things that you've done. I mean, when people say that you've broken down barriers. I feel like that's an understatement for, for your accomplishments. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, so well, welcome back to, to Charlottesville. Um, you know, I was telling Mark before you jumped on a little bit about um, how we first connected um, when you came here back uh, with the Harvest Festival. Exactly, yeah. That, that's, yeah, that uh, was great. Like uh, 2018 or 2017? Yeah. Was yeah. it 2017, 2017, 2018? Yeah, it all, it's, it's all running together. <laughs> Um, that's awesome, man. So since Harvest Festival, I mean, you, you, you've done, you, you, you haven't stopped. You keep going. You're doing so many, so many things. Um, how did you, how did you, how did that whole thing come about? Like, how did you end up taking that gig and, and coming out here to Charlottesville with connecting with that opportunity? Um, yeah, I think it was, um, 
a friend who connected me with it, um, who wrote the Who's in the Kitchen cookbook. And, um, you know, I, that was my first time at Monticello, which was really interesting. <laughs> I, really, uh, I really wanted to, um, you know, I always wanted to go see there, but I never, I never made it. And I, it was lovely. And it was really great to see it and to see sort of the new ways in which they were incorporating the story of the enslaved uh, people, in particular cooks um, and uh, Chef James Hemmings. You know, I just was, I become fascinated, <clears throat> excuse me, with this story. So it's, it's funny because like you, like um, I wasn't, from, I'm not from Charlottesville, so I wasn't familiar with the James Hemingway story. Um, when I first uh, moved here, and um, when I when I learned about it, I actually came across a chef out of uh, D.C. that was um, doing these dinners, um, these these James Hemingway dinners, and I was like, "What is these James Hemingway dinners?" And I did my homework and kind of dived into it. And I was like, "Wow, how powerful is that?" You know, it was a brother. <laughs> yeah, uh, James James Hemings, mm -hmm. and he, um, you know, it's very empowering to to know our story and the positive contribution that we made during those challenging times, um, especially in food ways. And he was trained in France, as was I. So I just felt this kinship um, with him. And also, you know, when he returned, he was not able to fully express himself and his creativity. And, you know, I also experienced that in parts of my career, not being able to be the creative person that I wanted to be because of, you know, barriers to entry. And, and I mean, uh, kind of segueing on that on that topic. I mean, I know um, the previously when we spoke, you know, you told me a little bit about your story growing up, and um, I don't know if you want to share it on the call a little bit about your parents and how, like, you know, they inspired you through that dinner club that they had. Yeah, the, you know, the, I, hindsight just like it's it's amazing. I I took it for granted, but um, my dad was actually raised in Virginia and my mom in Louisiana, and my dad got a job with Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York, and that's where I was raised. And uh, when I was about seven, they founded a gourmet cooking club with five other couples and they cooked and it was integrated. You know, it was three black couples and three white couples. It lasted for 20 years. Every month they met and they cooked food um, recipes, soup to nuts from cuisines around the world, including American regional cuisine. And so I was exposed to all this. And then when I went to college at UVA, I didn't realize, you know, many of my friends had not been exposed to uh, sort of exotic cuisines and I started hosting dinner parties and and working in restaurants and I fell in love with hospitality which is actually what I grew up with but again I kind of took it for granted um, and uh, it definitely shaped you know the rest of my life and and now my career. So you know like when did you decide that you know I want to cook like this is this is it for me I want to I want to go in this direction because I know you started out with with a different degree yeah, my degree was in Russian language and literature from UVA, and I applied to engineering schools. I did not get into UVA's. I took some prerequisite classes. <laughs> they really weren't working for me. So um, I enjoyed languages. I enjoy other cultures, learning about other cultures. And, you know, when I started working in restaurants, what I liked about it is um, it was very um, <clears throat> integrated and very interdisciplinary. There's so many different things to learn. And really, I went to cooking school because I always wanted to live and work in France. I studied French in high school and at UVA. And um, I also, um, I wanted to be a restaurateur who knew the food. So I really, the, being a restaurateur is really what inspired me and more of what I'm doing now. I'm not in the kitchen as much. I mean, I do cook. Um, but my real passion is serving people and also creating community in, in the restaurant. And it's, it's so funny, like you said, you know, hindsight, you look back, you know, your, your parents were able to do that with like the dinner club. Um, but what I, what I found interesting in, in, in that story right there was that, you know, you, you, you kind of just, you found yourself in the industry because it was low hanging fruit, um, you know, you, and then from there you kind of just grew. And it's just funny how, you know, people grow in this industry and we become chefs and we forget that this is an entryway for a lot of folks just to get in, just to start making money. Um, and, you know, not everyone comes into this industry with this, this, uh, I want to be a chef mentality. It's something that you kind of find on that journey of, of being in culinary or being in hospitality and, uh, you kind of find your way. So it, 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 uh, it, it kind of, you know, you got to pay tribute to the mentors out there that are really invested in people and that that's paving the way for them to be able to grow. I think that's awesome. 
So when did you, so you, you, uh, you, you decided you wanted to, you know, get into cooking, you went to cooking school, you traveled around the world, you went to, you went across to Europe and, and worked under some, in some difficult French restaurants over there. How was that? How was your experience over in Europe? <laughs> It was, it was actually great. And, it, you know, it was actually better than uh, when I returned to the States. And in France, if you, you were there to work hard and to be part of this um, sort of hierarchy, the chef is the chef. And the idea is that you will be taught everything. And no matter, you know, what you look like, no matter who you are, if you're in the kitchen, um, you are there to learn and to be taught. And when I returned to the States, there were more, you know, political issues regarding gender and race. And I had knowledge, uh, you know, withheld for me. So it was actually more difficult working in United States kitchens than French kitchens. Uh, that's so, that's so, so, so true. It's, it's, it's interesting from like, a, a, you know, I look at, you know, my trajectory with, you know, traveling around the world and, and, and experiencing, you know, different cultures and how relevant the culture was for me to understand the cuisine. And that the culture really impacted my understanding of cuisine. Um, so it's interesting to hear, you know, you say you came back to the United States and how our culture really gave you a different experience when it came to being able to really dive into the cuisine because of the barriers. Um, how would you say that, you know, that shaped you um, in, in carving your pathway as a chef? Well, I mean, there was a lot of self uh, teaching. So, you know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always been kind of a bookworm and I just, you know, just dove into as many cookbooks and food magazines as I could. Um, I reached out to, you know, different people who I found to be successful and, you know, just learn their journey. But I kind of just found my own way and took on responsibility of a chef position before I really felt ready. But um, it was the only way I was going to get the leadership experience is to just do it by, by you know, do it by doing it, <laughs> learn by yeah. doing it. Um, and then, you know, as a leader, it's been really important to me to look back and bring people up with me and to mentor because I did not have that experience really here. Um, I just, you know, I looked at people at a distance and tried to um, emulate what they had done to be successful but I didn't have the experience of anyone really taking me under their wing, um, which, you know, happens a lot more in uh, European kitchens. And it happens here too, but again, it was, it was definitely, there were barriers and, um, you know, being a woman and being a black woman for sure. What, what would you say, um, kind of looking back in hindsight, like what would you say was a pivotal moment in, in your career that um, you broke down a barrier that, completely, uh, you know, gave you the confidence to take over? Or was there a moment that, that you know, was a barrier breaker that gave you the confidence to push forward? Um, a, a little bit. Um, so, yeah, in 2000, I was cast on the Melting Pot uh, show on Food Network. And I'd never really done much television, but they were looking for an African-American female chef. And there just, there weren't a lot out there. And there weren't a lot that uh, they felt were telegenic, as they call it. And so um, I got that show and, you know, again, there weren't a lot of black faces cooking on TV. It gave me a new platform. It actually uh, gave me the platform to write my first cookbook. It gave exposure. And, you know, still to this day, there are young people come up to me and say like, oh, I grew up watching you on the Food Network. And, you know, they were, they were so excited to see someone who looked like them, you know, doing what I was doing. So I would say that that was really significant. And um, it didn't provide me with the, you know, the opportunity that I had hoped to get uh, financing to open my own restaurant or get an executive chef position. Um, that didn't quite happen. But, you know, it definitely was a great stepping stone. That's awesome. That is, that's so awesome. So like, uh, you know, this on your journey, how did you end up in, uh, in Oakland? Well, you know, ironically, uh, my parents met in Oakland and um, I had a great aunt living out there that we would visit a couple summers growing up, but it really, it, it wasn't on my radar, but the Bay Area was and wine country was, and uh, it was a culinary, um, you know, sort of Mecca that I really wanted to explore. I wasn't finding the kind of opportunities I wanted in New York uh, to advance my career. 
So I decided to come out to uh, the Bay Area and uh, do some cooking and work on my first cookbook. And I just fell in love with it. And I fell in love with Oakland because of the history here, um, the history of you know the black middle-class neighborhood that was established by the porters that worked on the, the railroads, uh, the Black Panthers. Uh, there's just so much um, that, that went on here, plus to have access to um, you know the fruit basket, the you know all the all the food ways that are out here, um, and it's just it's been a great place for me to just continue to grow as a chef and as a restaurateur and as an entrepreneur. Um, and so yeah, I'm out here to stay. It seems <laughs> I love Oakland. Oakland is like it's it's one of those communities that is like so diverse and it's so full of culture. I mean, just, just that environment in itself is, is an inspiring. What would you say is your inspiration um, nowadays? You know, what, what would you say you look to for inspiration, not just in, in your, your, your food and your restaurant, but just in, in general? Well, I mean, I, I continue to look to my community, my community of chefs and colleagues and what they're doing around the country and how everyone is, you know, just resilient and pivoting through COVID, through the movement through the fires, you know, it's just, it's really, um, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, we're already a fragile industry and, um, but um, everybody's staying pretty positive and, you know, I just try to, you know, move forward and I'm, you know, I'm inspired that the more, more people who aren't in the industry are more aware of, um, you know, what we're going through and more people are paying more attention to what they eat and, you know, who they support. Um, and yeah, I mean, those kind of things I, you know, we're not traveling right now, but I'm very inspired yeah, yeah. by traveling. Um, as you know, I've done a couple tours with the United States uh, Foreign Service Department as a culinary diplomat. Uh, I would love to get back into that when uh, we're able to travel more. That's been very inspiring for me because I feel like, you know, food is just a great way to connect people and uh, bring, people together and break down barriers maybe maybe kind of dive into the, i know that story and i thought that was an amazing story about like that opportunity you got can you share a little bit about that opportunity i think that's pretty amazing yeah it's funny you know i accidentally became a, a russian <laughs> and, uh and you know uh literature major at uva and there really wasn't, most of the opportunities uh, graduating were with uh military applications or um teaching and so it wasn't a degree that I really applied right away. And so five years ago, I received an email from the State Department saying that it had been requested that I come to uh, the country of Kazakhstan as a culinary diplomat. And I, I finally got to call my dad and say, the degree is finally paying <laughs> off, you know? And a friend of mine was just like, I don't know, that sounds dubious, but I did uh, go to the State Department. I happened to be in DC, I met with them. There was a, um, a chef's corps group they had been sending on these tours, but I was not a part of it. Uh, but I toured the country of Kazakhstan for about two weeks, um, teaching them about soul food. I went there to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the anniversary of the emancipation of slaves. That was um, the uh, Foreign Service officer's idea. He was from Kentucky. He was missing Southern and soul food. And I also was able to learn, you know, some of their cuisine and food ways and go to the markets. And it was just, it was amazing. It was great. I, I did visit the former Soviet Union in 1985 when I was a student at UVA. Uh, but this was a really um, deep dive into, um, you know, a unique culture that um, is a republic. Um, and they speak three languages, Kazakh, Russian, and English. And, um, you know, they, they're near, Uzbek, Uzbekistan and that cuisine infuses and I just learned so much it was it was really great and then a couple of years later I went to Mexico and Oaxaca uh, as a culinary diplomat and then last year Hong Kong and Singapore with Global SF and you know I just I, I love this work it's really great. That, that, that's an awesome story. And I think for folks out there that are in the industry or looking to get in the industry, I think that, you know, it, it shows how you can really, you know, you can really use a degree and it'll cross over into culinary in ways that you wouldn't even think. <laughs> like, like, look at that door that was open because of a degree that you got earlier on. That's, that's pretty amazing. So, yeah. so with, with, with your restaurant, um, what, uh, what inspired you to do soul food? Well, it's my heritage, you know, um, obviously my 
I'm African American. My parents are both from the South. And when I was, you know, starting out, I did not see a lot of restaurants that represented the cuisine uh, in a space that was um, more updated and with, you know, high-end service and high-quality ingredients and, you know, all of it at once. You would see uh, places where the food was amazing, but, you know, it was probably down some back alley or something, but they had been cooking it for for years and it was delicious. Um, or you would see upscale rooms, but the food was an afterthought. Um, and I just really wanted to bring it all together. And I wanted everybody to be welcome. You know, I didn't want it to be a place where it was just for African Americans. I wanted to introduce the food and the culture to anyone who just wanted to taste good food. That's awesome. And when you launched, how many, um, how many staff did you, did you launch with? Um, gosh, probably 10 to 12, 10 to 12. Yeah. That's awesome. That is, that is awesome. And like you fast forward to now, like what, what was your team? Well, pre COVID, like what was your team? What's your, where's your team at now? Yeah. So, you know, when I launched my restaurant had 50 seats and it was an old diner. It was really, I really bootstrapped. Um, and we probably grew to 15 to 20. And then, you know, I had a barbecue restaurant for a few years. I had but two of the two places. So then I probably had 30 or 40. We closed the barbecue restaurant in 2014. In 2019, I relocated uh, to a larger location, uh, Brown Sugar Kitchen, and probably had about 40 employees there, in addition to a location in San Francisco where I had another dozen. Uh, then closed that. <laughs> Then uh, COVID hit at uh, the yeah. beginning of the year. And so then I immediately reduced to maybe six to eight employees. And now I'm back to probably 12 to 15 part-time, uh, a few full-time. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been quite a journey, you know, being an employer, uh, steep learning curve for me being, you know, it, you know, there's such a difference between being a manager and being a leader and um, you know, <laughs> You just have to develop your skill set. It's a continuous learning process. I mean, that's one thing that was instilled in me as a student at UVA. You know, Thomas Jefferson referred to us as first, second, third, fourth year. And I'm, I guess, in my like 30 something year of, you know, my education. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's great to continue to learn, though. That's, that's, you know, I think that you kind of just, you, you hit it, right? Like the, the learning curve and being able to adapt and reach a level um, of, um, be, just reach a level of just like, uh, you know, hey, you know what, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to find a new way to make this happen. I'm going to find a new way to like break down a barrier. I think that's, that's pretty amazing. So with this new environment, like how has this affected you on a personal level? Um, and, and how has it affected you with business? Well, you know, I mean, I'm in this, um, you know, I've kind of been having a little bit of, you know, survivor's remorse in that I'm really thriving. I mean, COVID gave me an opportunity to slow down just a little bit. I mean, we really, we did take out right away, but the thinning out of the employees uh, left me a little bit more headspace um, to really work on the, the culture of my business that I wanted to create. And then once the movement uh, started happening, I just received so much support uh, from my community, uh, from the national community, um, in terms of you know media exposure and, now, the things that I've been saying for decades, everybody really is talking about and everybody wants to hear what I have to say. And so that's been great. I'm just riding this wave right now. Um, we were able to bring back some more employees. Um, so I have more support. Um, I have some new resources. Um, and so, you know, that's the thing. Like, I can become a better leader if I'm more resourced and I'm more supported by, you know, people who are really there and understand what my vision is. And I've, again, I've been able to add some people in really key roles to support me. And now I feel really ready to do what I set out to do, you know, 20 some years ago, I feel like more equipped and um, confident that, you know, I can be in a position where I can create more opportunities, not only for myself, but for those others that work for me and come, you know, uh, after me. 
I think that you just said something like, you know, as a leader, you know, like as a leader, like how has this uh, affected your ability to lead? I mean, like, obviously, you know, with all these things going on and it, it just like really just impacting you, um, how has your team handled it? And, and how have you been able to help them navigate using the skill sets that you have? Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's been hard for some of the team. Uh, some people are definitely more stressed out than others. Um, and, you know, I'm always, I've always been kind of, you know, quiet in the storm where I just feel like that's the best place to be. I'm able to really, um, you know, create some Zen moments for myself. And I have the perspective. I mean, I feel that the people who really are um, surviving in this time are the people who already had adversity and challenges in their lives. And this is just another one. And that's how I am. And so it was, you know, not, I mean, of course it's stressful, but it was a little bit easier for me to pivot um, because I have the perspective of knowing that, you know, this is not forever, things change. Um, this is just a, you know, a situation we're in right now. And we're also just bringing in new tools for the employees, you know, I have the opportunity to bring in um, some new people to train on service, on um, work-life balance, and, you know, just, just continue to, keep the environment as positive and, um, you know, forward thinking as we can. Yeah, you know, I feel like, you know, one of the big topics right now we're seeing in the industry is, um, is uh, you know, mental wellness, you know, and, and it is, it's funny, like right now, especially, you know, in this new environment, us as chefs already, we're already high, strong, high stress, there's a million things going on. Uh, but with this new environment, um, I, I, I've seen so many chefs really turn to other resources to try to, um, you know, to reach out and figure out, hey, man, I really have an issue. I need to deal with this. You know, I, I need to be able to help my team navigate this. A lot of people are coming to me and their their problems are kind of trickling into the business. Have you seen any uh, of that with, with your team? And, and if so, like, how are you, what are some solutions that you've, you've implemented to kind of help them navigate, you know, uh, their, their mental stress? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the more we can communicate and be transparent and have an open communication, uh, the better. Uh, it's just, um, you know, I try to lead by example and, um, you know, show that and, and tell them, you know, what I'm doing on my days off, I'm going hiking with a friend, you know, I'm resting. Um, and, you know, every day is, is a new day. We can't really, you know, bring our problems to work and, and dwell on things like that. We have to have, you know, we're customer facing. So um, not that we have to be artificial or phony, but we have to have a certain amount of um, professionalism um, so that, you know, we give the hospitality that people expect. And I think, you know, especially uh, when people were on lockdown, the little bit of interaction they had and they were able to come and engage with us to get the takeout was really important. And so um, it's sort of, you know, a little bit of a selfless act. You just, you have to, um, you know, you just have to step up and, and realize that this is why we're here. Um, but, you know, I, I do make sure that my employees have access. There's some local organizations that support, um, workers or um, you know lower income families uh, with mental health services and we also we always make sure that that information is available to them that's 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 awesome yeah. i mean like right now too i mean like thinking about how like you know we're, we're in a transient industry at least it was before covid i feel like now you know people are kind of latching on to to their jobs a little bit differently um yeah. But, you know, what, what we're seeing, obviously, restaurants are kind of slowing down because businesses aren't really moving. And uh, that means that the staffing pool has kind of like died down. Um, what would you, what, what, what's your opinion on the future of, of hospitality and, and culinary and, and the food and beverage world? Like, what do you think is going to happen? Um, well, I mean, there, there needs to be a really great shift. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be involved with uh, several organizations that are really trying to uh, think through uh, reshaping the industry um, on so many levels. And it's not just our industry, it trickles down to the consumer, um, also the farmers, the agricultural situation in our country, uh, you know, immigration, um, because a lot of restaurants are dependent on immigrants um, yeah. because the wages are low. So, you know, there's this disparity in 
you know, we, we're the biggest con uh, contributor to our national income, yet, um, you know, there's so many people living below the po poverty line or paycheck to paycheck. And uh, what we can charge for our goods and services is really not in line with what our overhead is. You know, I really think that the real estate uh, piece of the industry is really one of the biggest barriers to entry and one of the, um, the toughest, you know, things uh, to deal with. I think uh, realtors and developers need to start becoming partners with restaurants because restaurants create culture and community and um, they're a necessary part of, you know, our society, really. Um, a third place, you know, outside the home where people can connect with people who are different from them. Um, so, but, you know, I'm on the, the board of trustees now, the James Beard Foundation and the awards committee and um, we're, you know, reevaluating what is excellence. Um, does it have to be white tablecloth? Does it have to be $200 a plate meal, you know? Um, so there, I mean, and, you know, do you have to be European trained? Do you have to have a culinary degree? Um, so there, there's a lot of changes that are being discussed. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's necessary and it's time. I agree with you so much and the same over here, you know, I try to make sure that I'm involved with the decision making process because of how important it is um, for for future generations. I mean, obviously with COVID, you know, folks aren't really, you know, they're not going to restaurant, they're not doing the job trails, they're not, you know, not, they're not doing those, those stages like they used to. Um, and even with culinary schools around the country, there's been like a major decline in, in enrollment over the last five years. What do, you, what do you think some of the contributing factors to that is? Well, I think, you know, um, the culinary schools were overcharging uh, and a lot of people have really <clears throat> a lot of big loans. And then they realize that with their lower wages, it was really difficult to pay those loans. Um, <clears throat> even though I have been on the uh, food, you know, done a lot of food television, I think that there's a misunderstanding that, you know, so you're going to be a celebrity chef and a millionaire and that's exactly what, you know, what your uh, story is going to be when you graduate from culinary school. And the reality is, um, you know, those opportunities are few and far between. Um, somebody was asking about the, the organizations that support uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the James Beard Foundation um, has some, <clears throat> excuse me, um, within it, they, we have some committees that focus on that. Um, the Independent Restaurant Coalition is um, meeting weekly Zooms and having discussions about that. And I'm a member of Les Dames de Scoffier, um, an organization of women in food, beverage, and hospitality. And again, those you know, existing organizations are starting to open up to have like real conversations about like, you know, <clears throat> who are our members? Who are we reaching out to? Who are we giving scholarships to? Um, and... I'm really, you know, I'm just thrilled that these conversations are finally happening. So I don't know that it's one organization in particular, but within the existing organizations, um, committees are forming and conversations are definitely happening. I've been, I've been part of them and it's, and you know, it's, I just, I have hope now, you know, that there'll be some sustainable change. That's, that's, that's it. And I think that's what it's about, like sustainability. Like what does that look like for future generations? Cause I think that for a while they're agreeing with you um, you know, it was, it was scary. Um, and, you know, we, as chefs, you know, we were, we were talking about it, but I think that some of those larger institutes, um, you know, they're kind of like well -oiled machines and, you know, I look at them like the Titanic. They don't really want to turn. They, they, it's super hard for them to turn. Yeah, um, agreed. But, but uh, you know, COVID has really presented a new opportunity for folks like you and I, and, and so many other people with good ideas to come to the table to kind of help reshape the narrative and what that's going yeah. to look like. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think it's awesome that you're on these boards and these committees and you're part of that decision making process. Yeah, it's great to to have the opportunity to be impactful for sure. Yeah, I'm going to go over to uh, we have some questions up here um, and I apologize to the listeners. Um, I've been looking uh, at them a little bit. Have you? OK, good, good. I, I kind of just I say hi to my friend Melissa Palomi, who uh, wrote Who's in the Kitchen, uh, a collection of uh, recipes from, you know, cooks who uh, attend at University of Virginia, work at University of Virginia, live in the community, and hopefully 
uh, you guys will all get copies of that book. <laughs> That's awesome. And I mean, just kind of just, we'll start with her. She asked an awesome question. Um, you know, she said, uh, you know, when you came back from Europe, you said you were held back in the kitchen. Um, can you speak a little bit more on what that looked like for you? Yeah, you know, um, I, I worked in a couple restaurants and, you know, you know that you're going to start in the, in the salad station and work your way up. But, um, you know, a lot of them just wanted to keep me there. I would ask chefs, could I get on the hot station? Can I cook saute? And they kept saying, you're not ready. No, we're not going to give you that opportunity. Why don't you work the pastry department instead? And I'm like, I don't want to be a pastry chef. They would put a lot of the women in the pastry department. And, um, you know, I just knew that I wasn't being considered for leadership roles or any kind of advanced training. Um, you know, I wasn't able to, um, to butcher. I, you know, I requested to be able to, uh, to be taught. Um, even on my time off, you know, I would get a second job just to learn more. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, you know, I would see a lot of my male colleagues, in particular white male colleagues getting advanced who did not have the same experience. They didn't go to culinary school. Um, they, you know, they didn't have the same kind of uh, education I had, uh, but opportunities were presented to them. So it was a little bit disheartening, uh, but, you know, I just persevered and just kept trying to learn and, you know, find, find uh, openings. That's 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 awesome. I mean, because I think that that's it right there, too. I mean, I feel like you said something earlier that resonated with me where, you know, a lot of chefs like try to hold on to their, you know, their, I want to say the secrets, but like they don't yeah. want to share. And I think that, you know, it's um, that's a that unfortunately, that's a generation thing where I feel like there was a generation of chefs that, um, you know, you learn some secrets and they were like they, they hold them dear to their heart. You know, they're like, these are recipes that were passed down to me from five chefs ago and I don't want to share them with the world and you come in and you're busting your butt and you know it regardless if it's a technique or a recipe they don't want to share with you do you feel like uh in in today's times here we are in 2020 do you feel like that's still an issue where you have folks out there that are just uh not willing to share knowledge yeah I do and I I feel that um you know people are insecure and they feel like there's not enough room for everyone and and I and I've always felt like there's plenty of room for everyone and everyone can have their niche um, and, you know, I've written cookbooks, so I share my recipes. I'm not concerned that nobody's going to go and recreate uh, the exact same thing that I did, this exact same dish, exact same right. experience, because, you know, it's made by human hands and we're all different. You know, we're all going to um, have a different interpretation. Uh, but they're definitely, even as I got into food TV, you know, I had information withheld. I, I went to some of the really successful talent and I said, how do you leverage this? You know, what do I do? How can I get an agent? And they kind of threw their hands up and walked away. You know, they just, they didn't share. So yeah. again, you know, I just persevered and just kept talking to people and, you know, finally uh, kind of found my way. That's, that's awesome, man. You're inspiring me. I love it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the conversation, I'm going to turn and, and, and just kind of just take a, a step back and looking at the hospitality industry. Um, as you know, as a whole, I was reading this article last week and um, they were saying in New York City, 90% uh, of restaurants uh, and bars are expected to close. Um, on a national scale, they're expecting uh, without any type of relief, over 85% of restaurants will, and, and bars will possibly close. Um, obviously, we've been hit the hardest in the, in the industry. Um, and this is the bloodline for a lot of families and in, in, in the backbone for, you know, culture and identity in, in our, in our community, in our communities around the country. Yeah. How do you think, you know, you know, looking at this, you know, a year from now, like, how do you think this is going to impact <laughs> not just your community, but like the black community? Yeah, significantly, you know, again, a lot of the uh, restaurants that are under-resourced and typically it's, you know, minority uh, ownership, um, that's under-resourced because we have not had the same access to capital and real estate and um, are, are closing. And it's, it's really sad because it takes all types and, um, you know, people can't afford to live near where they work. Um, and, you know, so they're not, they're not making it to work and they're unemployed. And, but I just like, I believe that, this is a necessary part of our society, you know, the third space, the restaurant, whether it's a coffee shop, cafe, 
uh, you know, a diner, whatever it is. Um, I, I just think that it's really necessary. You know, it's in other cultures around the world that everybody has, you know, restaurants. Um, so I hope it'll come back in some form. I think there will be less of the fine dining because, you know, there's just not going to be the economy yeah. to support that. Um, and, you know, it's not really inclusive. And I think people want less of that. Um, so I think it's going to look different. It's definitely going to look different. You know, um, it's funny that you said that I was listening to an article uh, that uh, Thomas Keller did and he was talking about, you know, his restaurants and, and you know, it was, it was a bunch of other fine dining chefs in there and they were saying how, you know, they, the margins are already tight. Um, you know, one, one week it cripples their, their restaurant. One month, that's it. You know, there's really no, there's no, no coming back from that. And a lot of these restaurants, especially fine dining, they, they, they can't do to go. <laughs> They're not set up for to go. So like kind of understanding that in your community there, um, what restaurants have you seen that um, are, seem to be uh, weathering the storm the best? <clears throat> well, I think the restaurants that were already um, serving food that was easy to pack it up, um, whether it's sandwiches or pizzas, a friend of mine has a pizza restaurant. They're doing really, really well. You know, that especially people at home with their children, it's easy. Um, there's a macaroni and cheese restaurant in Oakland and they're doing well. Um, and, you know, we have figured out how to package, to abbreviate the menu to what I feel comfortable sending out, you know, uh, not having control of the plating and, and what the final product is going to look like. Um, and other restaurants like that too, um, who have full bars, you know, and are able to uh, sell batch cocktails and mm -hmm. bottles of wine and beer. Um, the ABC, uh, the a Alcohol Be Beverage Control uh, Organization, shifted really fast and you know made allowances for us to be able to serve, and that's really important because those are that's where we have an opportunity for some profit margins, and then also. Um, the city and state shifted here and I think in other parts of the country for outdoor seating. And so, you know, we were fortunate to have some sidewalk space and then um, some street space to build a parklet and doing the outdoor uh, seating. And actually, you know, doing well, the, the first day after the movement, we did higher sales than we did before COVID. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel really lucky and um we have been also taking donations to feed uh families in need and um to feed um you know frontline workers and just to you know and have those those uh, dollars match so we can continue doing that as much as, as possible and just sustain our core um you know workforce so it's just yeah everybody's just kind of trying to do it all whatever they can to hang in there yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, to your point, like I look at our community here in Charlottesville, um, you know, we have a, a very uh, large philanthropic community here. And, uh, you know, fast forward, you know, rewind three years ago, um, you know, I felt like in the, in the nonprofit sector, there was a lot of food uh, businesses that were kind of working in silos, but you fast forward now with, with COVID, um, everybody's come together from chefs to restaurateurs to, you know, the, in the nonprofit world, you're seeing all of these bridges being built and it's, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it's unfortunate that it took for COVID uh, for, for people to come together in this way, um, which kind of segues to a question that we have in the chat. It says, how do we use food experience to open doors uh, of community amongst cultures and race? What, what, what's, your, what's, your, what's your take on that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> it's, mor it's morning here. My voice is still waking up. <laughs> <laughs> it is super early there. <laughs> <clears throat> <I'm>, <clears throat> sorry. Um, well, you know, as I said with my parents' uh, gourmet club, I, it's just I was exposed to it my entire life. And it's sort of like their underlying message was, if people are gonna get along anywhere, it's over a plate of food yeah. and a glass of something, right? And that just really, you know, breaking down barriers in that way has just always been something that I've held with me, even when I arrived in Charlottesville and, you know, I went to the cafeteria and I saw the self-segregation and 
I question that. And, you know, I started having dinner parties with friends of different backgrounds. Um, and then afterwards, when I worked in restaurants, that was my vision to open a restaurant where everybody came in, where everybody felt welcome. And I've been able to create that, you know, and then with my travels through the, you know, the UN um, culinary diplomacy programs, people have a better understanding of, you know, us as, as Americans, when you go visit them and you, you share what we do there because they only, you know, they have limited ideas of, you know, our food ways. And now I have a better understanding, you know, uh, knowing the places that I've visited and what their resources are for, um, you know, agriculture and ingredients. And um, it's just all mind opening. And I just think if we have to continue to look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the world that way, because I mean, we're, we all have to be in it together. That's really, to me, that's the answer. I think that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to tag on to that because, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in everything you just said. And I, I feel like, you know, there's, um, you know, America is in a melting pot of culture. You know, we have so many different races that bring so many different uh, pieces to the table when it comes to food and, and cuisine. Um, you know, and I, I use, you know, what I do here in my kitchen as an example, you know, we will have someone from Syria, Afghanistan, and the local community all here in one kitchen, and they're bringing dishes and they're sharing food and they're sharing culture and they're learning from each other. It's just this environment where people can grow together and build off of each other. You know, yeah. just, just imagine if, you know, people did more of that. They came together just to learn about culture. Um, yeah. If there were more spaces that um, encourage that, I think that it would that it, that in itself creates a, a paradigm uh, shift in, in, in what what it could possibly become. I agree. We have more in common than we have differences, and yeah. um, you know, food is is one way to to demonstrate that. You know, because people are cooking okra in the south, but they're cooking okra in India. You know, and they're just doing it in a different way, but it's 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 familiar. And um, I just, yeah, I just wish there were, there was more opportunity to do that. And I, you know, I plan to try to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm going to ask a little bit about the, uh, you know, the market. When you look at the market right now, there are certain sectors that are just thriving, um, you know, consumer products, streaming services, mobile games. Uh, in some areas, real estate um, seems to be booming, especially like in areas like New Jersey and outside of San Francisco, <laughs> um, people are just buying up properties. Um, you know, how do you think that's going to affect the hospitality industry? How do you think that these, uh, these, these, you know, you look at Amazon, Jeff Bezos just became a trillionaire. Like, how do you think that these services are gonna, are gonna affect us in the long term? Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I just think that, um, you know, we've just got to have more of an equal distribution of wealth and opportunity, um, you know, so that we just don't become more divided. And, um, you know, we have definitely taken on some new uh, tech, um, I guess, you know, tools in terms of the delivery services and the ordering services and you know, we're, we're trying to be part of that so that, you know, we just become more integrated, but um, you're never going to be able to get rid of the, the human touch, you know, and I think, you know, the people who are moving um, outside of the big cities, um, they still need to eat. So there's, you know, a lot of my, myself and my colleagues, we're looking at um, doing pop-ups, you know, outside of our areas. We're not going to lease brick and mortar spaces anymore, but we might take a food truck or a trailer or you know, rent a van and um, go cook out in some of these uh, areas that people are moving to. Uh, again, just trying to create, uh, to continue to create opportunity for ourselves. Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a question uh, that I wanna share with you. Um, you all you know if you see it, it says, uh, do you think the school should include more about food in the cross section of subjects that, um, that can teach? You know, <laughs> um, what, what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a great, you know, again, everyone has to eat. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's a great way for kids to learn. I mean, there's science in cooking, um, geography, like, again, where, where does this food come from? Where did this ingredient come from? Uh, I think when uh, kids have like a tangible example, like you can, you know, you might not remember like, where's Morocco, but 
maybe if you taste, um, you know, something like if you taste harissa, and that'll remind you, um, you know, culture studies, of course, you know, to learn how other cultures, what their traditions are and history, again, like the spice trade or, you know, uh, the history of the enslaved cooks and math is the most essential, <laughs> uh, you know, for the restaurant <laughs> business, especially with the small margins, you know, it's, nobody likes math. Well, there are people that like math, but math is very important. Oh my God. It's so, so, so important. I would say that's one subject that in, in my programs that um, I try to harp on a little bit, just kitchen math, just understanding yeah. the basics to your point. A lot of people just, they don't feel like it's important, but it's so relevant. So, so relevant. Yeah. Your timing. Um, just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I had the opportunity to listen to a few of your podcasts. For those of you out there that don't know, um, you know, Tanya has an awesome, awesome podcast, which you can access it on Spotify. I'm not sure what other platforms, but you have it on, but I, I heard it on Spotify. And it's absolutely amazing, insightful. Um, it touches on so many different uh, subjects and the crossroads are amazing. Um, you know, maybe you could share a little bit about your, your podcast and, and what inspired you to start a podcast. Yeah, it's called Tiny's Table, and it's food, culture, and conversation. And um, I was working on a television treatment that was going to be similar, and I was hoping to bring people to the table that I've met that I wanted to have more extensive conversations with, people who are customers who were notable in their fields, but, you know, maybe like unknown foodies and, again, from different cultures. And yeah. then a friend of mine was working for this um, podcast uh, production company, and we start talking and they sent me some equipment and a producer and we just start doing it. And, That's awesome. you know, I, again, it coincided with COVID, even though it started before COVID, but uh, fortunately a lot of people were locked down and available. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have a great guest list uh, starting with Questlove, um, Culinary Luminaries, um, Alice Waters, Samin Nasrit, um, Danny Meyer, who's a great restaurant tour. Actor Gina Torres, Jesse Tyler For uh, Ferguson, um, and Aisha Tyler, uh, Egyptian comedian Basa, uh, Basim Youssef, uh, baseball great Kevin Euclid, um, R&B singers Lettucey Guapale, and I'm trying to think if I'm missing anyway, anyone else, but we're working on uh, booking season two, and we have uh, Danny Glover, uh, basketball player Festa Zazelli, Aisha Curry, um, and maybe the drummer of Metallica, Lars Ulrich. So I'm really, again, this is an, opportunity, awesome. an opportunity for me to bring uh, together diverse uh, experiences and uh, perspectives and, you know, and to also learn. And it's just, it's what I enjoy. I think that, you know, one thing that, you know, and I said this earlier and I'm going to say it again, um, you, you really break down barriers. I mean, especially for a chef, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of the times people look at you as a chef and they only see you from one light um, and you've really been able to diversify um, yourself and your brand and uh, show people that, you know what, food connects through many different channels. And, uh, you know, the podcast, I think it's just another channel that you're showing people like, hey, look what I can do. I was listening to one, uh, I forget who, who I listened to actually three of them, but one I was listening to, and it was just amazing how you were just building bridges between food <laughs> in the conversations. It was yeah. all of these food references, you know, and yeah. it wasn't just for chefs, but it was for people that, you know, that just genuinely love a good conversation. Yeah. Um, so I highly recommend people checking out that. And then I also wanted to plug in your book, which is awesome. It's absolutely amazing. I have your book. Yeah. Um, I have Samin's book also. Shout out to her. Um, I had a chance to connect with her. Yeah, um, we were at the Heritage Festival together. That was yeah, great. Yeah, that, how crazy is that, man? Like, you know, uh, these couple years later, you know, here we are doing this, this interview. Um, yeah. That's absolutely that's amazing. Um, and one thing I last I wanted to touch on, I know in California right now, um, you know, everything around you is, uh, is, you know, it's on fire. There's so many things going on. How yeah. are you doing? How, how is your, how's your family doing? How, how is everyone out there given the new circumstances with uh, the fires and stuff? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, it's really hard, you know, because it just, it's so destructive, the fires and, it's really displacing a lot of people, a lot of hard work, you know, I mean, there's a lot of restaurants and wineries um, and the workers that work there and the creatives that, you know, created that, like their life's work has been destroyed, you know, and that's just yeah. really heartbreaking. 
Um, I think the rest of us are just trying to survive so that we can later support them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting time because, you know, again, like there's sort of a captive audience. So the media world is kind of thriving and I'm on a production shoot right now in LA, uh, for, um, a, a TV piece and going into another one in a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, I'm glad to have these opportunities, but it's, it's just really, um, you know, I don't know, you know, what's going to become of, the, you know, my colleagues and yeah. the rest of the industry. And I think people are just, you know, very tenuous. And with the election pending, we just are kind of, you know, waiting to see what happens, but you have to just get up and go through your daily work. My, my family's doing fine. They're on the East coast okay. in uh, Tennessee and Virginia. And, um, you know, my friends, like we're just focusing on the little moments of self care that we can get. Um, whether it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I drove down to LA uh, on the highway, but I'm gonna meander back on the coast and try to enjoy the beauty of California that still exists, you know, while, while I have access to it. And, um, you know, hopefully in the new year we'll be able to travel, but you know, we, it, there's so much unknown that it's, yeah. um, it can be unsettling at times, but you just have to, you know, just um, take it a day at a time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your optimism. I'm grateful for your positivity. Um, I'm grateful for this conversation. Um, I think that, you know, there's so many jewels that you've dropped in this. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to have this conversation. Um, and then and maybe real quick, can you, uh, can you, can you give a plug on, is your TV show what, where people can watch your show uh, that you had before, how they can access some of that stuff, some of the footage? Uh, well, I mean, I think the Food Network Melting Pot, I don't know where you can find that. But, uh, okay, okay, because I thought it was some, like on Hulu or something like that. Uh, there's, uh, well, I just did Selena Plus Chef, which is okay. Selena Gomez um, recorded a show for HBO, and I did a, se a segment with her, so you can watch that. Um, I have some videos on YouTube for sure at Ms. Tanya Holland, and that's my social and uh, all my socials, Ms. MS Tanya Holland. And um, I'm working on a show that uh, will be airing around the holidays for OWN, the OWN Network. So um, awesome. look for me there. That is so, so, so awesome. Thank well, you. Uh, Tanya, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you for joining you me. This is, this, is, this is awesome. I know this is the first of many conversations that you, are gonna, you and I are going to have, um, but I, I really hope that I know that you've inspired some people out there and um, continue to do what you do. We, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and you as well. And I look forward to catching up more. We will. We will. Okay. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you, right. Juan. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here and being a part of this. Um, you know, we're all food lovers on our team, so um, this was an especially exciting conversation for us. Um, our hearts go out to everyone in California. Um, and we'd just like to, just to thank our sponsors for today, the Office of Equity Inclusion um, at Albemarle County, Virginia, um, and invite all of you who are, who are here to join us um, for the rest of Cities Rising. Um, we're in week three of a seven-week series. Um, later today, we've got a panel discussion with some major funders and community builders um, from Detroit, Michigan. So um, we're super excited, super grateful. Um, I can attest to both Tanya's Table podcast and Antoine's cooking classes at Culinary Concepts. We got some winners um, here with us today. So um, thank you again and um, wish you all all the best. Awesome.